Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Recovered alcoholic Mike. How's everybody tonight? There's this principle, which is a bar against all information, which is a proof against all argument, and which cannot fail to keep a man in everlasting ignorance. That principle is a contempt prior to investigation. That was my mantra for living for most of my life, and a lot of it also when I had some recovery time going together, and it kept me disconnected from God, kept me uh, on the verge of suicide, and it kept me a very unhappy camper for a lot of years. Um, and through the book, and a man who was strong enough to uh, bring me the message from, from the book, I have a life today that's beyond my wildest dreams. I want to thank Aaron for teeing up. That's exactly what this is all about. You know, I came in here with a problem with God, and I had a life that had a problem with God, and I found a loophole through the book to get God into my life, and it freaking rocks my life today. Um, to start off, I was born in 1959 in Minneapolis, Minnesota, to a uh, upper middle class family. I was the third son of three sons. Uh, my mom was a stay home mom. My dad was a uh, traveling salesman for a magazine. Um, I spent summers growing up in North Dakota on a ranch we had out there. And about six years old, I discovered alcohol. My mom used to have these dinner parties at her house, and we'd be at the, uh, watching all these adults having just a grand old time, sitting in the living room, eating appetizers and sipping on cocktails and stuff. And they'd get up and leave, go to the other side of the house for dinner. And I just pop up on one of those chairs, and I grabbed one of those little drinks. I can see it right now. It had a cherry in it, and it was some like, bourbon something or other. I just took a little sip of that and gave me a kick like I've never had a kick before. I'm like, yuck, I like this shit. <laughs> um, luckily, there's appetizers, so I had some appetizers while I was there. My mom's at the other end of the house having this dinner party. I'm having this like, little, probably a little cocktail party. Um, got myself up to bed, fell asleep, not a consequence. It was fantastic, you know. I really needed that drink. I was six years old, and I still and I really needed a drink at that time. Uh, I was the youngest of three boys, which meant I was the one who was getting taunted all the time. I was the one they experimented stuff on, so I, uh, I really needed some escape there. Um, growing up, I was a neighborhood uh, pest. Um, I had, uh, like I still don't much today, I had no filter. I found myself saying things at the wrong time and to the wrong people, so I was continually getting snuggies and shoving snowbanks and swirlies and black eyes, and I was getting myself in trouble. Um, so having that one drink, and then next time mom had a cocktail party, it did the same thing. It was like, no big deal. Everything was going great. My father died when I was eight-ish years old, and um, it wasn't... I really don't remember processing it. You know, I, I remember coming home and finding out he had died, and I, I remember crying and some minister stuff and the funeral and stuff like that. Um, I don't know if I really processed it appropriately, but boy, when I had that first drink about four, we, four about five or six, <clears throat> five or six weeks later, I got, well, I was at my friend's house, we were at the Jensen's house, and I looked in the dishwasher, where Mrs. Jensen, this is the alcoholic house, although they were the alcoholics, so this is where we all hung out before we went out and did uh, things to other people's houses, TP, damaging, vandalizing, that kind of stuff. So we're sitting in the kitchen. I haven't gotten a Snuggie yet. I haven't gotten a black eye yet. I'm still just sort of like fitting in with these guys, a little worried what's going to happen. I opened up the dishwasher, and here's a bottle of this vodka. So I pulled it up, and everybody's eyes just sort of like lit up. Like, ooh, look what he found. And I took the little cap off, you know. Everybody's like, no way, you know. I took a little sip. Ooh, shit. I got so drunk that night. I was the center of attention for the first time in years. I'm surrounded by all these other thugs in the neighborhood. Thugs. Um, and I went the whole night without getting a Snuggie, without getting a Swirly, without getting shoved in the snowbank. I was the center of attention. I remember falling downstairs and having fun. And I stumbled home just to the other side of the, there, right behind us. I'm going into the house, and I threw up all over the back porch. And I Made up the bed, and I woke up in the morning here, and my mom whooping on my older brother, going like, you shouldn't be drinking, you're too young, how dare you? And I'm up there going, oh my God, I'm going to... And luckily I didn't get caught again. 
And uh, I like that. You know, I was able to like be around these guys. Now, I'm not alcoholic because my dad died. I'm not alcoholic because I was the neighborhood pest or I got abused or things happened to me, you know. Somewhere in my drinking career, like Aaron, I loved drinking. Matter of fact, my dream in life was to be a bartender, um, belong, you know, belong to like the Rat Pack, hang out in nightclubs. That was my goal in life, was to be like this sophisticated drinker kind of guy. And uh, I aspired to that. I sucked at sports, I sucked at art, I sucked at school, I sucked at everything else, but I was pretty good at drinking. So I did, got really good at that. Um, junior high and high school, I was the uh, kegger caterer. People would call me up and I would show up to the house with like five or six kegs and I'd charge money. So I was getting really drunk and I was having a good time uh, getting myself in some situations that I shouldn't have gotten myself into. And I found myself in a few, per, few, per, few pertica, per, predicaments where uh, suicide was an option. Um, and I remember uh, sitting out in my car in my mom's garage. They, had, they weren't there that weekend. And I had uh, the car running. I'm in the garage with the windows down. And I got myself a nice little drink I made. And I rolled myself a good little joint, you know. And I'm sitting there listening to some Cat Stevens or the carpet and some really sad music. Didn't kill myself. Um, right, not much suicide, no, you know. And I had a little drink. Six, six, and I smoked a little pot. And after about two minutes, I'm going, why am I doing this? You know, it's like, it's not that big of a deal. You know, the, the drink solved my immediate instant problem. I was able to get over it. And I just continued drinking for the rest of the night. It was like no big deal. I woke up the next morning and the same problem was there, but it wasn't the immediacy. So right then, alcohol is starting to save my life. I'm like trying to kill myself, but alcohol is stepping in and preventing that to happen. It's happened three or four times. I was like, you know, you're not supposed to be killing yourself when you're in high school and going to college. So I went to college. I picked my college based on the fact that the cocktails were 25 cents each, highballs were like 45 cents each, and it was awesome. I went to three classes that whole year I was there. I went to three classes. Um, I was drinking, I discovered a rascaler, and my life was on fire. I loved it. At the end of that uh, quasi year of college education, I got a little letter asking me not to come back. So I got a job back at home as a bar back bouncer in a biker bar which was really cool because I was the closet gay guy back then. And I'm working in this biker bar, which is really not conducive to that. And, uh, but it was great because I learned to drink. Now, these guys knew how to freaking drink. And that's where I discovered my panacea, cocaine. Because I loved drinking. I loved cocktails. I loved doing all that stuff. But I would pass out or I would get sick. And, damn, that cocaine just let me drink for days. Two days. Three days. It was like... After, about, after a while, I didn't even need a job. I'll sell this stuff, you know, and I can drink all the time. I remember mom one time asked, oh, things got really bad, and mom decided to buy me a house a few blocks away from her because she does that. And uh, she was asking me about where my money's coming from, you know, where am I working. So I told her I worked at this managing some pizza parlor type thing, one of the many jobs I had, supposedly. And uh, she called there one day to talk to me about something. And they're like, who are you talking about? <laughs> this guy doesn't work here. And I'm just like, so the lies started piling up. Um, I started losing my roommates because it was like, all I did was drink and do cocaine. You know, I, I was my best customer. I was my worst customer. You know, I owed myself more money than my customers owed me. Um, people used to come up to me after weekends and say, I did your blow last night. I said, how do you know? He says, I've been in the bathroom all day. Quit cutting that shit. I was doing more than I was selling. It was just miserable because you had co cut cocaine, it's not good. Um, the power was getting shut off. The gas had been shut off. The, uh, the garage was full of pizza boxes. That's my life, you know. I'm going to parties and I'm just miserable. I want to die. Um, I, I, I want to quit drinking. So I, I get really smart. I put a rubber band on my wrist and say, I'm only having a couple drinks tonight. I put certain stuff in this pocket to do and the other stuff to sell. And after a drink, the phenomenon of craving kicks in and the rubber band's in the audience and I'm drinking what I'm supposed to. I'm going through all my product and I wake up in the morning just deeper and deeper in debt than I was before. Um, I was swirling the drain. Suicide was actually becoming more common. Um, my parents came to me one day and said, we're going to Europe for three months. We need you to come and watch the house. Fantastic. They have electricity. They have heat. They have food. 
They have money. Um, so I'm given a ride to the airport, and on the way to the airport, my mom reaches over and gives me a couple checkbooks and some credit cards and says, if you have an emergency, here's some emergency money. <laughs> they thought something was going on. They weren't really sure. They were 70s parents, you know? Um, the airplane hadn't even taken off, and I'm already at the bank withdrawing money. Um, about three, two months into their vacation, I'm up to about eight or nine thousand dollars stolen from them for uh, pizzas and cocaine and keggers and you know, just free for all. You know, my parents had a really big house, and we used to we had stolen some wheelchairs from a hospital, and we used to have like wheelchair races around the house. It was uh, it was completely out of control. I remember I'm having some problems. I want to. I want to not live like this. I want to put down the drink. I want to put down the cocaine. Not completely, just be able to handle it normally, and that was becoming impossible. So one time I was sitting in one of the rooms, you know, doing some lines, drinking some tequila, and uh, I thought I'd call Cocaine Hotline, because I seemed to be doing too much cocaine. So I called the Cocaine Hotline for help, and they put me on hold, and I uh, sat there for like two minutes and said, screw this, hung up, and continued to drink. Um... I didn't want to live like that. I remember I wasn't happy anymore. I just wanted it to end. And my attempts to try and stop and control just were pathetic. They would not work. I'm not going to drink today. Everything's fine. I'm not going to drink. And then 10 minutes later, I'm drinking. So here's the deal. A week before my parents are coming home, it's up to like ten, eleven, twelve thousand dollars $12,000 stolen. And the stuff's going to hit the fan when they come home. It's like, what am I going to do? I decide I got three decisions. I can steal a lot more money and just go live in California for the rest of my life and never see my family again. I can tell them I'm a drug addict alcoholic and I need help. Or I could kill myself. Well, the kill myself never worked. And the California thing sounded like a really bad idea. And rehab sounded like, well, it might work because I wanted to quit. I wanted to control my drinking. So I figured if I did this thing, we'll see what happens. So my parents come home and... Uh, I wake up about 11 o'clock, come down. By the way, I was supposed to have picked them up that morning in the airport, and I didn't. And I come down, and they look at me like, I look like hell, apparently. And I said, I'm an addict, alcoholic, and I need help. And they, they, their eyes just lit up, you know. They knew something was wrong with their baby boy. And I go, oh, by the way, I stole $12,000. And they just sort of like, let's get you in rehab. Um, 15, 20 minutes later, out of the blue, this lady called my mom. My mom's this author. And she called my mom asking her some information about one of her books. And she just so happened, she's like this lady who works at Hazleton, this place up there. And uh, my mom's, oh, my God, my son, he just told us he's an addict alcoholic and he needs help. And she says, well, we can maybe do that. You know, bring him in for evaluation. So I went in for this little evaluation meeting. And mind you, I'm 24 years old, sat there, asked me some questions. And they said, we're going to put you in adolescent care um, with a bunch of 16, 17-year-olds, um, but we can't get you in for like three or four days. Mind you, I'm 24 years old. I'm being put into adolescent care. That's how mixed up I was. I'm going to mess I was. So about three or four days go by, and I'm trying not to drink, and I'm sneaking out. I can't, you know. It's just not working. My dad's just furious. He's like, why don't you just not drink? And I, I can't. I don't, I don't have the faintest idea. Why not, you know? So I went to Hazleton, um, did some, cleaned up some messes, and I went to Hazleton. My first night in Hazleton, it was a meeting similar, a lot smaller, but they had the steps, and I was sitting on the front of the front, front row. And I looked up, and I start reading the steps, and I'm sort of like, okay, I can do that. I did this. You know, I didn't have the faintest idea what I was doing, but I sort of thought I was with the step program. And that night, they gave me a medallion. I thought, this is cool. This is great. And the next morning, the process began. They, they introduced me to my, my small group, and they said, we're going to have you fill out these workbooks as part of our program here. And I said, well, you know, I'm dyslexic, and, I, and I'm not a very good writer. I don't think I can do these workbooks. And they said, well, that's okay. We'll get you an intern. So they got this little girl just out of some college to dictate my book work with me. So she starts asking me these questions, you know, about alcohol consumption. And all this. I'm just, I don't really know what's really going on. I just keep ask, asking me these questions. We're going through therapy. We're eating good. We've got some recreation going on in this place. And I remember that we started doing some prayer. You know, just ask God in the morning to help you get through the day. And um, while I was in the middle of my addiction, before I got to Hazleton, those times I wanted to kill myself, I, I remember praying, God, please help me. 
you know. My life sucks. I want this to end. Just help me. I don't know what to do, please. Because I had turned my back on God years ago. I didn't know it intentionally, but I had slowly walked away from the relationship that I had with God as a kid. Um, in my mind's eye, when I was praying back in those using days, it was like this wooden wooden door that had cracks in it. On the other side, I could see this glorious light, which was God. And I'm this low-life piece of crap on the other side of the door, and he doesn't want anything to do with me. That door is a barrier, and I just can't go through it. I'm pushing on the door for years, and nothing was going to work. I thought God had cut me off a long time ago. But I'm in therapy, doing this book work stuff, not really sure what it's all about. And I'm praying one night in bed, and uh, I said, God, wherever you are, whoever you are, I need help. And all of a sudden I saw in my mind's eye the, the door, that damn door, with the light behind it. And I'm just pushing on that door, and I hear this pull on the door. Okay. So I pull on the door, and next thing you know, I'm bathed in white light. It's like this white light experience that we hear about. I didn't have the faintest idea what it was at the time, otherwise, but at the time it was just like this really inexpensive acid trip. It was really cool. I, up until that point, had been sort of like this annoying little pest in, in the Hazleton thing. And after that moment, I had just completely shifted from being a lying, cheating, stealing, low life, self centered, inconsiderate, self serving, backstabbing to this like happy, joyous, and free guy. Just instantaneously for the next three weeks, I'm in Hazleton just like having this great time. Captain Therapy, Mr. Recovery, you know. Um, doing this papers and these workbooks, not really understanding what it's all about. Um, but I'm really enjoying this new way of life I'm having. Not really paying attention to the therapy that's going on. In order to get out of therapy, in order to get into my halfway house, I have to do a fifth step. In order to do a fifth step, you have to finish a fourth step. And I don't even know, I, I didn't know I was doing a fourth step. Um, but I went to go talk to my uh, halfway house counselor who's going to prove whether I move in or not. So I showed up with this packet of information, which turned out to be my fourth step packet. And he's looking through my stuff. You know, deciding whether he's, I'm good enough to get into the halfway house or something. And he, he, he's just this big red-haired guy. He's from the, from the Iron Range. He's wearing big giant beard and, and flannel. Just a scary dude. And I'm sitting across, you know, and he's looking through my paperwork. And all of a sudden he gets this look on his face. And his eyes just sort of, it's like, what did he see? You know? What did I say? And he looks at me and he says, so you're a homosexual. And I go, Yeah. And he sort of does this uncomfortable look and pauses for a minute and looks at me and says, I used to get drunk and fuck pigs. I go, okay. Years later, I find that when you're doing a fist step, you're supposed to say something to make them feel comfortable about the problems they're going through. And that really didn't do it for me. It was it, it, it just, I wasn't that much comfortable after that. So we do this. I'm not even sure what it was. He just, I'm, I'm, he's reading stuff that I had written. I'm talking, and all of a sudden he says, don't do that stuff again. And I said, okay. And he said, curfew was this. This is how much you got to pay. Everything's going to work. Are you going to move in? I was like, great, I'm in, you know. Went to Hazleton Halfway House, and they told me to get a sponsor. I said, yeah, uh, yeah, okay, whatever. And I got a job in a bar, and I got fired from the bar because my drinks were too weak because I turned alcohol. It was recovered now. I wasn't getting other people drunk. It was just ridiculous. It wasn't working out, so I moved down to Florida. Got a uh, sponsor in Lambda. Um, this guy was amazing. He was about this tall, um, and he was he saved my life. You know, he, he introduced me to people in the Alcoholics Anonymous community in, in Fort Lauderdale. Um, he got me involved in the society. He got me in, in fellowship and cocktail, or not, soon not a cocktail party, <laughs> coffee parties. Um, and he kept going to me. He's like, so Mike Chase, let's take you through the steps. And I would go, Joe, Hazleton, white light guy. I don't need that stuff. I'm doing all right. And he's like, yeah, we'll see, you know. Fourteen years. Well, my first year was on fire, you know. I loved life. I loved Alcoholics Anonymous. I was, you know, I said, you ask, you ask me to do something, I do it. Make the coffee, do the meetings, chair me. I'm doing all that stuff. And he keeps asking me to do the step stuff. I'm going like, Joe, white light guy, Hazleton, I'm cool. Don't need those steps. Um, Fourteen years later, I'm up in Minneapolis 
plotting to kill myself. Um, I had a white light experience in 1984, but I neglected to find out how to keep it. I neglected to find that there's certain things that you got to do in order to stay connected to God. For 15 years, I was on sex sprees, shopping sprees, work sprees, <sighs> job sprees, um, temporary fixes, but I wanted to die. There were times where I just was miserable. I thought that that's what recovery was. I thought that that was sobriety was. Just don't drink and go to meetings and shut up and put up with life. I thought that that's what it was all about. So I went back to Minneapolis to like get some crystal, check into a fancy hotel and kill myself. I thought I'd go to one last AA meeting. So I went to this meeting and I showed up there and I'm like, hi. And I walked in and I sat down and everybody's like talking to each other. It's like this really happy, great AA meeting and nobody bothers to say a diddly do to me. I'm just like, okay. Should I have stood up and said, hey, you guys, I'm on the verge of suicide. Somebody please come and help me. Didn't know any better. Didn't know that's what we're supposed to do. Um, I left that meeting with a firm resolution I was going to kill myself. Um, luckily, the next day I met somebody that changed my life. Um, I went out for some coffee in a bar with him, and uh, he says, "Would you like a beer?" And I said, "No, I don't drink, but I'll have an Amstel Light." The damn thing's coming at me. I'm going, "Not a good idea. Not a good idea. Oh, I don't know about this." And this amazing thought came to me. It's like just like out of the blue. It said. They have a seat waiting for you if it gets too hard again. So I drank. And for the next six years, it was, uh, it was fantastic. It sucked. It was miserable. It was wonderful. It was this roller coaster of just, and in the end, I wanted to die again. And in the end, I ended up in the Fort Lauderdale psych hospital. Just battier than a bat. Bat shit crazy. Diagnosed with multiple things that they probably invented just to keep me from going out in the street. And, uh, before that, 2005, 2004, my roommate, loving, compassionate guy that he is, sort of got the opinion that going three or four days with no sleep wasn't very healthy, and he decided to tell my parents that I was drinking and using drugs again. So my boss one day at work said, you know, Eduardo called. We're having an intervention with you this Friday. Apparently, he told everybody that you're getting high again. And I go, ooh. And my boss looked me straight in the face and says, get your shit together. Okay, let's see what we can do. Um, yeah, right. Um, luckily, God had put this little Weasley Big Book Thumper guy in our office. He's supposed to be doing sales, but he's basically doing 12-step calls all the time. It's so cool. And uh, we had talked a little bit about my previous great AA and what he's doing. And, and I, I went to him after this conversation with, with Peter, and I said, uh, Ross, I need to go back to AA. Um, my parents found out that the jig is up. And he says, great, I'll bring you to the dry dock tonight. Okay. So I get on the phone with my mom, and I say, Mom, bad news, I've been drinking and using drugs again. And she's like, I know, we heard. And I said, well, don't worry, I'm going back to AA tonight. And she says, okay, cool, hung up the phone. Five o'clock rolls around, getting ready to leave, and all of a sudden Ross comes up, and he says, well, let's go. I go, where? He says, we're going to the meeting. And I says, like, oh, yeah, crap, okay. So I went to the meeting. Uh, I followed him, took my own car, and I sat down in the room, front row. And it was like I got home. It was just, oh, it felt so good. It's like I'm back in AA. I love it. It's so cool. It was so nice and friendly. And people are coming up to me. They're giving me the phone numbers, you know. And it was just like, pat me on the back. It's nice to see you. And uh, I picked up a white chip, you know. And it's like, I'm, just, I'm on fire. And I'm, and I'm leaving. I'll see you guys tomorrow. This is so cool. And I get in my car. And I'm pulling out the parking lot, also my phone rings, and it's my drug dealer saying, I got some really good stuff, come on over. I said, I'll be right there. Click, hung up the phone, looked up specifically and said, I guess it's not ready yet, am I? So, a year later, I end up in the psych ward. You know how that ends up. Um, I'm walking home from the psych ward, um, public bags, poverty stricken, just depressed, and uh, I went to uh, downtown Dry Dock, picked up another white chip, got some more phone numbers, was told I don't have to drink if I don't want to, I was told I don't have to drink between meetings, even if I, you know, just don't drink, go to meetings, that kind of stuff. And I thought it was really great advice. And I, and I started going to IHOP, I-O-P, it's an I-O-P. And uh, it was Tuesday, Thursday, Friday night, something like that. And um, we, we talked a lot about why, aren't, why don't you have a sponsor? Um, you should be going to more meetings. You know, there's one around this whole circle three times a week, not much recovery. Um, I knew that I wanted to get back into A, but I had to do this, this I, IOP stuff. Um, 
I learned much later that if you relapse and nobody finds out, you still relapsed. That was sort of interesting. Um, God, what's that all about, right? Um, I had this grand sponsor that used to come up to me, walk right up to my face and look in my eyes and go, that honesty is a bitch, isn't it? And I walk away and I go like, shit, he smelled it again. Damn. Pick up another white chip, you know, and get some more numbers and get great advice. You know, you got to double up on your meetings. You know, and I was in AA jail. I would wake up, I'd run to Victory, I'd go to work, I'd get off work, I'd run to Dry Dock, I'd go to Coral Ridge, I'd go to Atlanta. I was going to meetings every, if I wasn't sleeping, I was in an AA meeting or at work, you know? Hurricane would blow through. No meetings, no work, no IOP. My chase is getting drunk again. My chase is picking up a white chip again. And it's just getting miserable. I, I, I just wanted to have like a couple drinks. I just wanted to have a couple lines, you know, and get to bed by eight. <laughs> Wasn't working, you know. And, and finally, on my last relapse, I answered the phone. Never pick up the phone on a relapse, right? Um, and it's my sponsee brother, and he's on the phone with my sponsor, my grand sponsor. It's busted. I'm completely wasted. And uh, I go to the downtown dry dock that next day. And I, and I just stand up in the middle of me and I say, I need help, you know. You tell me don't drink between meetings and you won't get drunk. I can't. I do. You tell me just don't, you know, drink through 90 90. I'm hearing all the stuff that's not working for me. I said, I need help. I don't know what's wrong with me. And little Ross comes up to me and says, I'll take you through the book. I go, cool. I really don't want to, but whatever. I, but I really realize it. I must be one of those real alcoholics again because I cannot not control my drinking. So we met. Took me through the book. Took me the first page of Alcoholics Anonymous, which says, Alcoholics Anonymous. He said, this is what you know about Alcoholics Anonymous, the name. Everything else you think, you know, forget it, because you're obviously not working. I want you to start out fresh. And it was cool. And we started reading the book from page one. Every sentence, every paragraph, every page, he took time to talk about it. We, it wasn't just like, let's just read through this book and get it over with. It was an opportunity for me to get to know him and build a relationship with him. We were praying. We were talking. And there was like this whole thing going on. I'm excited, you know, because it was not getting drunk. I used to tell people, yeah, I'm praying in the morning. Let's, you know, I wasn't. I was lying. But when I started working with Ross, I was praying during the book. I was praying after the book. And I started praying in the morning. And my life changed. Once I was told in my real last time to go home and read the doctor's opinion. Okay. Next time I saw him, I said, did you read the doctor's opinion? Being an untreated great little liar. I said, yes, I did. But I had it. It wasn't until I sat down with my sponsor and he read the book with me. that I was able to understand about this phenomenon of craving, the mental obsession, you know, the three-part mal- three mal- disease, you know, the spiritual malady disconnect from God, totally disconnected from God. I know exactly what that's like, you know. God didn't want anything to do with me, I thought. Mental obsession. I could not not go a day without thinking about where am I going to get some more tequila, where am I going to get some Mr. Get High, you know? And that physical allergy that kicks in, absolutely. I go to the Vistro Las Olas for two drinks, and next thing you know, it's 4 o'clock in the morning. I understand that stuff, you know? And he got me into the steps when we got to the steps. We read the forward to the first, we read the forward to the second, the doctor's opinion, Bill's story. I was able to see a little bit more of what alcoholism is to you know, Bill's story, then we're reading the, there's a solution, and I always wonder where this God thing, you hear a lot of like, God, 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 and all of a sudden it's like, they stumbled across, it was like this accidentally found the solution to alcoholism was a relationship with God, more about alcoholism, that was that opportunity for me to really evaluate my past and whether I'm an alcoholic or not, because if I'm an alcoholic, I am totally freaking screwed, means I'm going to die, I've learned that in the previous pages. Problem was, I really wasn't all that hot with God yet. You know, I'm praying to him. I didn't really understand the relationship too much. But we read, we agnostic. I started off reading that contempt prior to investigation. I thought I was the most open-minded person in the world, you know, until he started challenging my thoughts about things, my position in life, my relationship with God, what it meant to be a good man, what it meant to be a, you know, a good worker. And I realized I was just a total F-tar, you know, and everything. And I needed some major help. And he helped point out, you know, in, uh, more about alcoholism, and there's a solution that, you know, therapy works on a lot of people, you know, learning how to eat, learning how to cook, learning how to be a better person can help a lot of people get their act together and get on with their life, but for an alcoholic, that type of stuff is not what really works. I need to have God come into my life 
and do like I like to call it the control dot control delete. You know, just completely start me from scratch. And and by doing a third step prayer was the first time that I had decided I'm going to stop doing lying, cheating, and stealing. I was going to turn my life over to God as I don't understand Him and just get through the steps and see what happens. You know. So he gave me the four step. And I remember I'm calling people on the phone. I'm sort of going through this thing, and it was sort of an adventure. I liked it. And then I went and did a fifth step with this guy. We went over to his house. He sat down. And we talked for like six hours. And he pointed out that I was a real f tart. I was a lying, cheating, stealing, all life self-centered, inconsiderate person. And that's what's blocking me from God. And I'm always worried that someone in the back is going to come up and get me. I'm worried about the future. I can't live in the moment. I'm completely overwhelmed with everything that I've done. And I need to, like, beg God to help me to be a better person. So we did a five, six, seven right then and there. He sent me home. I, I tried to be quiet for a while. Did the best I could. We got together the next time. We did steps eight and nine. He taught me how to do a 10 and 11. Started doing some 12 step work. And my life was on fire again. I was happy. I started going sideways. I started going to meetings. I hadn't really been authorized to sponsor yet. I hadn't asked. And he had started dating this gal again. And he sort of got a little busy. And I got sort of busy. So I'm just going to meetings and stuff like that. And I started getting sideways again. And I was at the meeting one day. Um, and this guy comes walking around the corner, and first thing I thought about is I've got to hope my car's locked, because this guy doesn't look like it's really safe to have him walk, walking around. Um, by the end of the meeting, I'm, I've asked this guy if I can sponsor him, you know. So um, I had purpose. For the first time, you know, I'm sitting down reading with this guy, talking with this guy. It's like, God, this is what it's all about, to sponsor somebody. Now, mind you, I didn't really know what I was doing. I threw in a little bit of Hazleton, I threw in a little bit of Big Book, and I threw in a little 12 and 12 and some living. So I was like this, this buffet of stuff that I really didn't know what I was doing. And um, dang, he stayed sober. He's sober today. You know, he's happy, joyous, and free. Um, changed my life. About that time, I discovered Big Book meetings. I went to a Big Book seminar. I discovered... A big book sponsorship, you know, the, the same thing that my sponsor had brought me through, and that's where I am in my life today. You know, I've, I've got this opportunity to um, bring people to God through using the book. And what I learned in the 15 years of sobriety I had before is it's easy to get sober or dry. The secret is doing something with it and making something of your life of it. Um, I remember in 84 when I got sober, it's like, oh, I got so much to get back. I've given up so much for drugs and alcohol, you know. And it was a selfish, self-centered 15 years, and it was miserable. You know, and in Bill's, in the doctor's opinion, it starts off like this. I'm talking about Bill W. here, and this is, this is cool stuff. In the course of his third treatment, he acquired certain ideas concerning the possible means of recovery. As part of his rehabilitation, he commenced to present his conceptions to other alcoholics, impressing upon them that they must do likewise with still others. This has become the basis of the rapidly growing fellowship. You know, for 15 years, I hadn't the faintest idea about sponsoring anybody. I had, you know, I had myself to take care of. This time around, you know, I, I'm blessed that I'm actually able to, like, sit down with guys. You know, you, if you've never had the opportunity to sit down across the table from some guy who's just coming apart at the seams, you know, he's shaking, he's dying. Um, you know, we come to Alcoholics Anonymous, and he seriously wants to get help, and he wants to change his life. And I know what it's like to be told, don't go to meetings, or just go to meetings and, and walk out without any hope. But you sit down with a book with some guy, you know, and you start reading the book, and you develop a relationship, and you introduce him to, well, I introduce him to our sponsee family, and I see the light come out of these guys' eyes. You know, that's what it's all about. And they talk about the, the fourth dimension. It's not like not waking up hungover. That's great, and I like that. And, and not having the obsession, that's great, and that's part of it. But that special feeling you have when you're doing God's work, you know? I had been godless for so many years, and today I know God's just using me. And I'm just, I have no life. Everything I do today is, is God-inspired to help somebody else find God again. There's more to recovery than just not drinking. I was reading this fascinating article, you know. Adolf Hitler didn't drink. Go figure. How's that supposed to make us better by not drinking? There's a lot more to it. <laughs> you know? It took a minute for me to think about it, too. It's like, yeah. 
uh, Alcoholics Anonymous is, is the, you know, I read it in the forward to the first and forward to the second back in the days that these guys stumbled across accidentally the solution to mankind's greatest problem. And there was a certain um, emergency to spread the news because people were dying back then. I don't know what's going on today. You know, I see a lot of guys dying today and they don't seem to be in a hurry to get sober. They don't be in a hurry to get a solution. And hopefully, you know, someone's going to hear something in the next few months that's going to get them excited and maybe find somebody who can bring them to the book and get them connected to God and then let them bring somebody to God. Because I've seen it. When I got these little guys that I'm sponsoring and I get a call at 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock at night after they just read the forward of the first with somebody and this guy's like excited and they're on fire. It's like, that's what it's about, you know. Purpose and reason for living. It's, it's what I'm all about today. Um, so I've been sponsoring people. I've been uh, meeting a meeting uh, on a big book study, working on that, and uh, I thought he's doing great. I'm having this amazing time, you know. And uh, I got a new sponsor a few months back, and it's, it's, it's been a life-changing experience. I, I used to think I was doing steps 10 and 11 pretty darn good, you know. I occasionally thought about it. Um, occasionally I would, like, think about my day. That was my quasi-11 step. I was praying in the morning, you know, and I was doing some meditation in the morning, doing all that stuff, but I really wasn't reviewing my life. You know, I had started going sideways again. My ego came back. My pride was coming back. I was becoming sort of a douchebag at the office again. I was becoming a douchebag in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, he pointed out in the book that there's specific directions on how to do an 11th step at the end of the night, you know. And it's not some casual, just like, yep, 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 not, not, not. It's like he's got me writing stuff down, you know. And it has made such a change in my life. I feel like so much more connected to God because I'm like looking at what's going on in my life. I start my day without any any hangovers from the day before. And I got that 10-step inventory going on. Um, last week, we just started a, a steel on steel thing with a couple of guys. And, and we sat down, four of us. We have prayer meditation. And then we uh, have some specific questions on where we are in our lives today, according to God recovery, society, and I got some, some heavy information thrown at me that was like, wow. And it's, it's an opportunity for me to grow and get better. It's a blessing, you know. Everything in my life today is just is, is keeps getting better. Um, I'm blessed that people allow me to, to sponsor and bring them through the book. You know, it, it's an honor and it's a privilege to help people find God. All I'm doing is reading the book, you know. I, I if I tried to sponsor somebody like Dr. Bob or Bill W. did, I'd have a success rate like Alcoholics Anonymous does today, you know, 8 or 9%. But when you, when you read the book, I'm doing pretty good. I'm staying sober. I'm getting helping other people find God. I, I think that's what this is all about, you know, just helping other people help other people because if people are dying. Um, I was at a meeting the other night. I heard some, 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 some pretty scary stuff. Um, that Obamacare, the right, to, the, the whole thing, it's coming down the, the pike and it's going to happen. You know, we got to learn to deal with it. What just recently happened is the, um, the, the psychiatrist or something, they've just lowered the bar of what it is to be an alcoholic. So in 2014, when that right, when the health care kicks in, we're going to start seeing hundreds of more people coming into the meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. We're going to have a lot of people coming in who are real alcoholics, and we're going to have a lot of people who aren't. Back in the 80s, the same thing happened. We got swamped with a bunch of people. So in 2004, we got about a year to get ready for being swamped. There's going to be thousands of people coming at us, and we need to be ready for that, you know? So if you're not sponsoring people, please start sponsoring people, because we're going to need a lot of people in, soon to catch this wave, because it's coming at us, and it's, there's no stopping. And if we're not ready, it's not going to work. It's going to be a mess, so... And trust in God that, that people are going to get prepared and, and get ready for it, because that's what it's all about, saving lives. Um, God took a lying, cheating, stealing, low-life, self-centered, inconsiderate, self-backstabbing, self-centered, hard like me, you know, and gave me a life beyond my wildest dreams to have purpose and to be filled with love and to have a family that... Uh, and, and my family, family loves me, but I got a family, little uh, people that in my recovery family. This is amazing. I'm surrounded by love, um, which is what it's all about. And I don't know. 
I, 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 I want to end with this. You hear the nine step promises a lot, you know, um, which they're, they're great, you know. This is what I wanted when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, and this is what I got, and this is where I'm coming from today. Mm-hmm. And we have ceased fighting anything or anyone, even alcohol, for by this time sanity will have returned. We will seldom be interested in liquor. If tempted, we will recoil from it as if from a hot flame. We will react sanely and normally, and we will find that this has happened automatically. We will see that our new attitude toward liquor has been given to us without any thought or effort on our part. It just comes. That is the miracle of it. We are not fighting it, neither are we avoiding temptation. We feel as though we have been placed in a position of neutrality, safe and protected. We have not even sworn off. Instead, the problem has been removed. It does not exist for us. We are neither cocky nor are we afraid. That is our experience. This is how we act, so long as we keep in fit spiritual condition. The original guys, the Oxford Group guys, Bill W., Dr. Bob, Clarence Snyder, the original 4267, got sober in the Oxford Group. The Oxford Group was a first century Christian fundamentalist organization that was based on a relationship with God. And they had specific rules called the four absolutes that they gauged their life and recovery on. Absolute honesty, absolute purity, absolute love, and absolute unselfishness. If you can live that way, you're going to have a rockin' diddly do life. I hope you guys uh, get God. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.